Hey folks, how you doing? Dave McRae here. So I just wanted to quickly jump on and talk about the exorcist believer. Finally, give you my thoughts on the exorcist believer. Now I know I'm late to the party on this. The movie came out in October. It's January now. So uh, it's been a little bit, but if you follow me for any length of time, uh, if you have followed me for any length of time, I should say, uh, you know that I don't jump on the latest and greatest titles uh, for the purposes of getting content out there. Uh, sometimes it takes me a bit to get to them if they're things I want to talk about, but the exorcist believer is definitely something I wanted to talk about. I'm a big fan of the original, of course, a big fan of that third movie. Uh, and I know a lot of you want to know my thoughts on The Exorcist Believer, so let's dive right into it. Okay. Uh, first, let me uh, preface this by, uh, or preface my thoughts by saying this. Um, as you know, there's a there's a lot of hyperbolic nonsense online. What a shock, right? Especially when it comes to the world of fandom. There's a lot of hyperbole going to the extreme. Uh, so let me first say that, um, uh, let me tell you the camp that I do not fall into. The camp of viewers, the category of viewers, the group of viewers I do not fall into. And that category is the group of viewers that say things like, this is the worst movie of all time, this is the worst movie ever made. David Gordon Green is a terrible director and he should be shot. He should never touch another movie ever again for as long as he lives. He should never make another horror movie ever. Uh, this is an absolute dumpster fire, a, a catastrophic failure of epic proportions. It's the worst movie ever made. It's just dog shit. It's an absolute fucking... <laughs> Uh, I do not fall into that camp. Uh, I do not think this is the worst movie ever made. I don't even think it's the worst exorcist movie ever made. However, however, what is the camp I do fall into? What are the group of viewers I do agree with? Well, I tend to agree with those that have watched the movie and say, listen, it's fine. It's fine. It's not great. It's not, it's, it's fine. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I agree with those that say that the first, I don't know if it's the first half, I don't think it's quite the first half, but certainly the first, what, 30 minutes or so uh, is really good. Right up until the girls are discovered alive, right? From there on forward, our trajectory starts to begin to fall into pretty pedestrian paint-by-numbers territory when it comes to demon possession movies. Um, but up until that moment, I'm not saying it was brilliant, I'm just saying up until that moment, I was locked in, I was dialed in, you had me. There's a lot of mood, a lot of atmosphere, a lot of mystique, eeriness, tension building, slow burn, character development. I was in, I love the mystery, you know, the girls going missing, I really like that. I thought the performances and the kibitzing back and forth seemed very natural and real. I liked the casting and it felt genuine you know, the relationships between everybody. It felt authentic. It felt real. Um, so I was, I was in, I was dialed in. Um, and then once, of course, it gets to the girls being discovered, uh, like I said, we fall into sort of that paint by numbers territory. And it's almost as if like, you know, they have this demon possession manifesto, you know, where they're like, okay, guys, uh, all right, now we're getting to this part of the movie. All right. Uh, now I want to make sure that we have um, uh, a demon face behind an actor and he doesn't know about it. Do we have it? We don't have it? Well, I know it was done in Insidious and 500 other movies, but do we have it? We don't have... Put it in! Put it in! Look, look, we're doing a demon possession movie. That's what we have to do. That's what it says we have to do right here. Thank you. Uh, do we have levitation? Every demon possession... God, we have levitation. Thank you. Uh, do we have... Like, you know what I'm saying? Now, obviously, there were a few uh, uh, tropes that we, we did not see. Thank goodness we didn't see the contortion, you know, spider... I mean that. God, if there's one thing that's overused in those in, in that subgenre, it's that. It's creepy as hell. But when you you know oversaturated, it no longer becomes creepy. Um, so, uh, but it kind of felt like we were moving into that territory. Now that doesn't mean it was bad. It was competently made. The special effects were great. The makeup effects were great. Shout out to Christopher Nelson. Did a great job. The little girls were fantastic. If they decide to stay in this business, they have a bright future. Um, they were really good. I thought the performances were good. Um, um, it just, in terms of the trope, paint by numbers, sort of demon possession manifest, you know what I'm saying? It kind of fell into that. And it was disappointing. And But it's not a bad movie. It's just, you know, when you have, you know, when you're doing a sequel to arguably not one of the greatest horror, not just one of the greatest horror movies ever made, but one of the greatest 
movies ever made. The Exorcist is one of those horror movies that 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 crosses the threshold of its own genre into the pop culture zeitgeist as one of the greatest films in the history of cinema. And so when you are doing, when you reach that level, it's not like just a regular horror movie that stays in its lane. I mean, this is one of the greatest films ever made. It was nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, the first horror movie to ever be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. And so... You know, it's, it's, there's far more, it's a character driven film rather than a plot driven film. There's so much, there, there's so much, there's so much going on in The Exorcist in terms of, you know, uh, cinematic language and symbolism and, and, and character development. And there's just, there, there's, it's, it's just a brilliant story and a brilliant film. And it's creepy. Uh, you know what I mean? It's got that going for it. But it's not creepy because of the 360 degree head turn and, you know, your uh, mother sucks cocks and hell and fuck me, fuck me, and all that. That stuff's great it's sure yeah it, it, it's it's brilliant but there's more to it there's more to it and the exorcist believer has wisps of that but it didn't quite go there because of the era we're in now in filmmaking i don't necessarily think that blumhouse and universal were the right fit for the exorcist but we'll get to that here in a second so uh, so yeah, I thought the first 30 minutes was really good. Uh, and then we fall into that paint by numbers sort of area. I will say this though, too. I will say that, uh, when the girls go off into the woods, uh, this is just a, a thing that I would have actually liked to have seen, or maybe even not seen. Um, I don't think we should have shown what they were doing in the woods. I mean, I know it, it doesn't ruin anything, but you know, we see them in the woods and they're kind of trying to contact the spirits and she wants to talk to her mother and, all. and that's cute and that's great. And it doesn't ruin anything, but I think it would have been cool if maybe we know that's what they're doing uh, or maybe we don't, I don't know. Uh, but we see them walk off into the woods and the, you know, the wind is blowing and the leaves are, you know, rustling and they're giggling like cute little 13 year old girls. And then they just disappear. And we don't know. We don't know what the fuck is going on. Like I, I probably would have played that angle to it, but nonetheless, that's just a thing that I, that I noticed. Um, uh, and, um, uh, yeah. And, and so, um, and, and two, I was very disappointed that, that we didn't have tubular bells. Now I know we had wisps of it, you know, when, uh, Leslie Odom Jr., I believe the actor's name is, I forget his name in the movie, uh, when he was, you know, basically preparing to go off and find, um, Chris McNeil and drive out to see her, we heard like, it was almost like this and it was cool. I liked it, but it was almost like this sort of remix of the, of the, you know, the theme. And, and it felt like we were building to that crescendo where it was going to kick into tubular bell, tubular bells. And it was like, yeah. And it never did. It never did. It only played it during the end credits. It cuts to black. There's the title. Then it begins to play. And I'm like, okay, that's great. But where was tubular bells throughout the... I, I wanted it in the movie, in the narrative, and it never did. You, it was like blue balls, man. You get to that ball, it's like, ah! It doesn't make the movie any better or worse. It's just a, a something that I noticed. And I'm like, no, you need to play that shit in the fucking movie. And it absolutely should have been played, if anywhere, during his you know uh, journey off to go and find Chris McNeil. And then maybe when she comes to the window and maybe begins to play, you know, it's like, ah, oh, yeah! Uh, been great. Chris McNeil, Ellen Burstyn. Um, I felt they did her character a bit dirty. Um, I feel that if you're going to, I don't know, it, it felt a little disrespectful to stab her in the, in the eyes. Although I love the creative choice to use a crucifix to do the stabbing. I think that's so, that's so evil. Um, but it just felt like they wanted to do something. They wanted to do something that would shock the audience to a legacy character to communicate to the audience that nobody is safe. So imagine if we stab Chris McNeil, Ellen Burson in the eyes of the crucifix. Oh my God, she's blinded. That's crazy. That's crazy on paper. And yes, I agree, but I, it just didn't feel earned. I, I, it felt a little sort of, uh, like that's what you were doing. I, I, I think I, I, I needed more with her. I needed more, I don't know how you do, I don't pretend to know how to do that. I'd have to look at the script and deconstruct it, but I'm saying it, it, feel, it felt a little shoehorned in. I think if you're going to go that far, just kill her. You know what I mean? I think you could just kill her. Uh, now, you, you can't just kill her. It has to be properly motivated. And as I've often said, you know, uh, it's not that legacy characters die, it's how they die. And, and, and I don't know if there was ever an opportunity even in that scene for it to be justified, but it just felt a little disrespectful to her character. Um, and it was a little strange. And then you just throw her into the hospital and there she is. Now, maybe it was because, listen, Ellen, listen, we would have loved to have had her come back for the whole movie, but she didn't want to do it. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. Who knows? There's lots of things that we don't know. Um, 
So they had to figure out a way to get her in and, you know, kind of have their cake and eat it too. Okay, fine. But, uh, you know, and she was fine, but, uh, but uh, I wasn't crazy on it. Uh, the Linda Blair cameo at the end. I don't, I don't even know what the point of that is. You know, I knew that Linda Blair was in it. Uh, I didn't know in what, in what capacity, um, but I thought that she was going to bridge a gap between Believer and the sequel Deceiver. Now that doesn't mean that she has to be, she has to be in the sequel like all the way through and all of a sudden she's this main character. I don't think they would do that, but I thought she was going to somehow come in at the end of Believer as the catalyst to bridge the gap between Believer and Deceiver. And then maybe she's killed off in Deceiver or something. I don't know. Um, but the way she came in was useless. I mean, other than it being cool for the first time to see these two actors you know on screen together for the first time in 50 years I'm, I'm assuming at least in these roles um okay um but it does nothing to the main plot and i guess chris mcneil's story and her, her estranged daughter are, is some sort of little subplot i don't know do we know why they weren't speaking to each other i've only seen the movie once maybe it was clearly communicated and i missed that i don't know maybe i was looking at my cat when that happened i it was i i'm not sure but i don't recall Chris McNeil ever giving a reason to why they're not speaking. And not that it's important, but her coming in at the end, I'm like, so why are you here now? Well, mom's in the hospital. Well, okay, but, you know, so she's good enough to come to when she's in the hospital, but not good enough to keep a relationship going? Like, I, I don't understand that. Other than it's just, hey, isn't this cool? Yeah, it is. But if you're not going to extend it into the sequel or there doesn't affect the rest of the... I don't understand. I, 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 I feel it's, a, you know, again, there's lots of things I don't know. I mean, who knows what the contract was, whether she wanted to do it or not, or she said, listen, I'll come back, but I'll only do this. Or, who knows? There's a lot of uh, variables we don't know, but it, it felt like it, it, it was, listen, we can't just leave this little thread of Chris McNeil in the hospital blind hanging because people are going to be like, well, what the hell happened to Chris McNeil? So I got an idea. Why don't we have Linda Blair come in as Reagan and uh, that little story beat is wrapped up. It's wrapped up. It's it's like oh Chris, and it's like okay, okay, you know what I mean. But it, it didn't, eh, you know what I mean. So I I I'm I feel a little uh, uh, weird about the uh, the the cameo. Um, but uh, but yeah, look, I mean overall, again overall, I don't think it's a bad film. But you know, The Exorcist is a movie that 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 surpasses its own genre. And it's a it's a real film. Uh, there's a lot of layers to that movie. And when you're going to do a sequel to The Exorcist, arguably one of the great one of the greatest movies ever made, not just horror movies, uh, there is a level of maturity and 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 real sort of maturity to the script and layers to the script and to the characters and to the and how it's drawn out and the pacing that needs to be there. Um, you're not just making another demon possession movie. And I think the spirit was there. I think, you know, when I listen to David Gordon Green talk in interviews, like, you know, I want to make a psychological movie that's more about, like he's saying all the right things. And you do get that. Like you see that there, you feel that there. There is, it, it does exist, especially in that first, you know, uh, 30 minutes or so. But it just, feels like a Blumhouse movie after that. And, 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 I, and I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, Blumhouse, as I, I think I was alluding to earlier, is, is more of that populist kind of uh, production company. And, and they throw everything and the kitchen sink at the, at the wall. Not that the kitchen sink would stick to the wall, but, you know, everything at the wall um, uh, to see what sticks. And, you know, for every really great Blumhouse horror movie, there's 10 that are not so good. And, and so he, you know, I was going to say he, because, you know, of Jason Blum, but Blumhouse overall uh, is more of that, uh, more of that mass produced kind of get as much out as we can. And, and, and uh, so, you know, there's good with that. You get a lot of horror movies. And uh, I know that Jason Blum tends to hire, you know, first time directors and he tends to give them a chance and he tends to give a lot of creative freedom to his filmmakers, which is really good. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, the filmmakers would no doubt really like that and appreciate that. Um, but there's so much they're turning out. Uh, I don't think that Blumhouse and Universal uh, were the right fit. Um, and then you could ask, well, what would be the right fit? A24? I mean, that seems to be the the cool thing to say, you know, the buzzword, A24. I don't know. 
I don't know if A24 would have been the right fit, but I think the, the, the reason why maybe, maybe is because they tend to focus more on more mature scripts, grounded themes, uh, you know, fleshing really sort of the layers, the psychological, the cinematic language, really sort of, you know, fleshing things. I'm not saying every movie they do is a hit in the world of horror. I'm just saying that when you watch their horror movies, they tend to be thematically more mature and grounded and not so populous filmmaking. Um, and I think that that's what The Exorcist sequel to The Exorcist needed to be. That doesn't mean that it would have been a great movie, um, but I think in terms of its feeling and its, it's, it's, it started out that way there it, it, it's a weird dichotomy because as, as i said the first 30 minutes kind of feels that and then it kind of now just feels like a blumhouse film um and it needed more than that it needed more than that it, it was i was disappointed to to see that but if it didn't have the exorcist in the title it's just it's a it's a fine uh serviceable possession thriller i mean it, it's it's what it is it's it's not a terrible movie um but it all depends on what your expectations were there's a lot of expectations around that you know when we go back to 1973 you know when the exorcist came out it was a different world you know, you've heard me say that many times it was a different world it was a much more naive world a much more religious world you know the ease of access to information was not as readily available as it is now there was no internet no social media so you know you got your information uh from you know the six o'clock news and the newspaper the next day you know by and large you know people trusted their institutions they trusted their media outlets they trusted their news you know um reporters so it was a much more naive easy easier to manipulate uh, uh, world. And so, you know, people were not exposed to, to uh, visually disturbing things like we are today. So when The Exorcist came out, it was, it was terrifying. I mean, absolutely terrifying terrifying and 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 uh, on many different levels and and now we're so desensitized that to do a sequel to the exorcist and for blumhouse to take it i think it was doomed to fail in, uh, from the very beginning um in terms of what it needed to ultimately be from top to bottom a to z uh in the hands of of Blumhouse. Blumhouse is not, they're, they're not a terrible production company. They make good movies. They just make populous horror films. They make horror films that appeal to the masses. And, 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 and rightly so. I get it, right? They, they, they specialize in spending 10 million and making 80 million. You know what I mean? And, and, but with a, a direct sequel to The Exorcist, one of the greatest films, films of all time, um, I think it needed to be maybe in different hands. Um, maybe that's also including David Gordon Green. Maybe that's also including David Gordon Green, Daniel McBride, and Scott Teams. I mean, I mean, who knows? I don't know. I don't know what sort of, you know, leashes they had and what sort of red tape they, they, they had to go through with terms of this movie, but, um, it's not a terrible movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it's certainly not what we all hoped a sequel to one of the greatest movies in the history of cinema would be. And, and I think it's very difficult to produce an exorcist, an exorcist level sequel today with a populist production company like Blumhouse. It, it's just, it's, 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 I, I don't, it just wasn't the right marriage. Um, so, you know, yeah, the, the, those are my thoughts, uh, on, uh, the exorcist believer. Uh, there's, there's, you know, some good things in there. Some things I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. And then there's some things I'm like, uh, you know, here, here we go. You know what I mean? But, but my takeaways are that the first, uh, yeah, th um, 30 minutes are, are really good. Um, and the girls are really good. The makeup effects are great. Um, and you know, there's some moments of, of, oh, you know, uh, throughout, I, I thought the little twist, uh, you know, with you, you didn't want me, you wanted mom and all that. I thought that was, I didn't see that. I didn't think that I, I, I don't know why, but, um, I thought that was really good. And that really shows really tapping into his vulnerability and exposing his secrets and things like that. But we never really got to see where that went after that. Like how did it just felt, um, anyways, I could go on and on and on, but it, there, there, there were a lot of things that felt unfinished and not fleshed out. And, uh, the spirit was there. I, I could feel the spirit. Um, but it just, I think it just needed to be something a little different. Um, overall, overall, 
Uh, and there's, you know, again, if I want to take more time, I could probably get into it a bit more, but, um, and really dive into it. But I, I'd have to watch the movie a few more times to, to kind of see that. But, uh, but overall, those are my thoughts. Uh, and yeah, so anyways, folks, my name's Dave McRae. Jump in the comment section below and let me know your thoughts on The Exorcist Believer. Uh, what did you think of it? Do you want to see it continue? I, I don't really care. I mean, I, I'd be curious to see, you know, because obviously it's not going to be David Gordon Green. And, and so I'm, I'm curious to see if, if they're going to, it's, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't, however. Um, but you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not totally adverse to it. Uh, but I, I don't, I, I just don't think today in the hands of Blumhouse, uh, you're going to get the exorcist movie that you need in order to pay respect to the original, uh, in order to be in the hands of filmmakers and a studio or a production company that understands what this is really all about. Uh, and the, and, and the layers of the symbolism and the cinematic language and the story and the characters, you know, this isn't about, you know, creepy faces and levitation and, and it, it, that, that stuff's good. Um, but if you don't have, have something rich and deep built in, uh, you know, like they did in the original. I mean, the original is is a is about a priest that you know loses his faith and ends up you know sacrificing himself to save a little girl he's never met. And I mean, there's so much there, there's so much going on there beyond Reagan possessed that it just fills it out with such richness, you know. And and um, I just don't know if, if in the hands of a Blumhouse if we're going to get that. Anyways, like I said, my name is Dave McRae. Comment below and let me know your thoughts. Uh, if you want, if you want to follow me on Facebook, X, or Instagram, there are my links right there. My links are also in the description. Check them out until your heart's content, and when your heart is content, check them out again. That'll do it for me. In the meantime, and in between time, I will talk to you soon. There we go. That's better. <laughs> Cheers.